everybody and welcome to another episode of Convict Christianity. We are the hosts, George and Ilya. How's it going? Doing well. And with today we have Tom Eglinton with us. He's the pastor slash bishop of Smithfield Baptist Church. Thanks, St. George. And uh, he's written numerous... How many books have you written? None. None. Oh, sorry. <laughs> he's read <laughs> thousands of books. <laughs> written zero. <laughs> Now he's the uh, he's the pastor at Smithfield Baptist Church, and he's going to join us today. We're going to talk about the doctrine of separation between the church and state. So we'd just like to welcome everybody and thank you for joining us. So just to kick us off, um, there's a lot of bit of com- there's a lot of confusion out in society today, especially as we're coming up to an election, um, and we have obviously different opinions going around and different thoughts floating out there. Um, the view of the separation of the church and state, what does that mean? What does that look like? How does that affect us as Christians? And, you know, what do we do about it? Um, and so I thought I'd just kick off by playing something for us to sort of just listen to and engage with, which I think is a very common view of what people think is uh, the doctrine of separation between the church and state. Am I saying that correctly? Is the doctrine of the church the same? Um, we get what you mean. Yeah. We get ev- what you mean. Everyone else will get it too, don't worry. <laughs> so this is this is actually an uh, interaction with uh, Jeff Durbin. Um, he's interacting at a university with a college student um, on the issue of abortion. Um, and so he's going to interact with her real quick now about um, the doctrine of separation between the church and state. Where did that doctrine come from? Oh, I don't know, like moral, like common sense. No, it came heard? from the Christian church. Okay, it came good, from the biblical good, worldview. Good, good and what did it mean? Christians. What did it mean? It means that we need to separate legislation. Nope, legislation. that's not what it means. That's what it that's means. That's not what and Thomas what Jefferson it, said. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I, don't care. <laughs> I, don't care. <laughs> I don't care what Thomas Jefferson said. <laughs> Only one, one of the founding fathers of America. It doesn't matter what that guy reckons. Uh, well, that it's is like saying, "What do you think?" It doesn't matter what you <laughs> think. <laughs> well, that's the common view today, right? Um, that you can't, as a Christian, have uh, your Christianity uh, affect your view on morality, on legislation, on laws. Um, your your Christianity and uh, your uh, church life and and what you do in your heart stays in your heart. That can't affect anything else. Yeah, we, we like to solo it, solo it out. Yeah. yeah, especially regarding politicians. So no, not so much you sitting at home, but politicians can't allow their worldview to affect how laws and legislation, um, not how sorry, but what is put forward to the people. Yeah. So, so an example might be um, abortion, for instance. You, mm. you can think that abortion is wrong. Um, but you're not allowed to impose that morality into law. Yeah, that that's that's the the false idea. Just yeah, to that, be clear. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> the that's the general view. It's not the right view. <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. And so, uh, Tom, what is? Can you give us a brief understanding? You know, someone comes up to you on the street. Hey, what's the what's the separation of church and state mean? Boom, boom. Um. Well, I think I think mainly it's to do with uh, function. So um, you have there's this concept of spheres of responsibility in the Bible. Um, you see it really clearly in in ancient Israel. Um, there were the there were the priests, the Levites, who were given responsibility over worship. Everyone came and engaged in worship, but it was the priests who were to run it and to run the show. Um, and at one point, actually, one king came and tried to run the show of their church service. Yep. Um, and the priest, 80-odd 80, 80 priests walked out and said, yeah, you're not getting past us. Mm. You'd have to, you have to kill us or we'll kill you, one of the two. <laughs> 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 Let's have a go. Um, and so you see it there. But the priests didn't try and, engage and run the country. Mm. Um, that was the king's job. Yep. And so there's this distinction made there. And then you have other spheres as well uh, of areas of responsibility. Family is a big one. Um, and depending on how far you want to go, you could say like a business is another area. 
where you have a structure, a hierarchy of, you know, and you might have your business, but your business has no business telling my business what to do. You know? mm, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it's, a, it's an area of responsibility that, that you have some sort of sovereignty over, some mm. sort of rule, yeah. And so all, all these different, I guess, spheres are governments in and of themselves. That's right. Because yeah. they're, they're to govern... A particular area of life. Of life. Yeah. Yep. So the husband should be the king of his home. Yep. The, the business owner should be the king of his business. The pastor, in one sense, is the king of the church. That's right. Um, yeah. And the king is the king of the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And Jesus is king of all. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, go. Yeah, so th- what you were just about to say, I was just pretty much going to say the same thing in the fact that Jesus Christ being king of all established those spheres and he established them to be governed separately. Yeah. yeah, and it's a gift. It's it really yeah. is. It's a wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I can imagine if if there was no government, and everyone just went about doing whatever they wanted in their families, it would be chaos. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, you, there's no sort of national structure mm. to the group of people who live in this area. Yep, um, it'd be crazy. Um, and so, so simply, all we're stating is that we have these different spheres or different areas of life. And that one should not rule over the other, and the other should not rule over the other one. It's not. Qu- it's not quite so clean as it sounds, though. No, I know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not because so there's cut a whole bunch dry. of yeah, a yeah. whole bunch of things yeah, that that's right. that there's crossover with. Yep. You know, an example might be, um, let's say, uh, a husband murders his wife. Right. Don't do that. It's bad. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> but um, but if that happens, well, the family has an issue in it mm. where there's been some disruption and the f- and the fam the family is going to have to do something about that the church if that guy goes to church he should be put under church church discipline, discipline. Yep. the state also has a stake in that claim because mm. he's broken laws of the land which are right laws that should be laws that say don't kill your wife um and so the the state needs to do something as well so all three spheres have have a claim on doing something about that one action. Mm. So there's all these, there's, it's sort of like a Venn diagram. It's not distinct spheres that don't overlap at all. Explain what a Venn diagram is. Oh, sorry, a Venn, Venn, it's where you have circles that cross over. That's right. Yeah. Very good, very good. Like the Olympics. Like the Olympic rings. Yeah, yeah, that's Or it. Audi. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, that's a good one. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's less crossover from multiple rings on Audi than there is in the Olympic rings. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fun <Just> fact. <laughs> <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> anyway. The diagram, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a wealth of knowledge, you know, guys? <laughs> <laughs> Read me like a book. <laughs> uh, so, oh. uh, establishing that... Um, and it might be a bit early to jump into this, so we can come back to this later. But in establishing that is the fact that it, it is Christ that established these fears, but on top of that established this overlapping. And in the Western world, this is where we get our Judeo-Christian values from, of when the fears can overlap. And that's what the separation of church and state, doctrine, even law, if you want to say, is there for. Well, it's definitely a doctrine. Yeah. Well, I'm... Um, I'm fairly sure, or um, maybe not. It, it's a, well, it's, it's, a, it's in our constitution. Yeah, I was going to say a, a church can't run the yeah, state. Yeah, no, no, yeah, and the state can't run the church. Can't run the church. Yeah. So that, that that's really the distinction. Yeah. It's not so much like that we're going to define the areas of crossover. Yeah. It's more the state has no right to tell the church how to conduct its worship. Mm. Sorry, Anglicans. Yep. Um, and I'm not the, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> don't be sorry. Don't apologize. Don't get me started <laughs> again on the <laughs> <laughs> and the um, and the church has no right to run run the state. Mm. Sorry, Roman Catholics. Yeah. Why are you saying that? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Calvin. I, well, well, I love Calvin. No, I love Calvin. No, 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 that's no, seriously really? debatable. That's the way really? yeah. oh, I think <laughs> I've only read his institutes and his commentary, guys. <laughs> yep. I disagree with you, but anyway. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. 
I take that back, guys. No, don't take it back. No, I'm scared now. Tom's <laughs> looking at me like he's going to punch me. Hold to your convictions, man. <laughs> I'm I'm willing to fall on my sword on this one. Right? There's many more which I'm not. Don't worry. All right, that's good. Uh, yeah, what were you saying? I was just saying that you, it, it's it's not it's not that there's no overlap. It's not about defining the overlap mm. so much as making the point that one doesn't have total ownership over the other. Mm. Yeah. So pretty much what we're saying is a Christian can be prime minister. Absolutely. A Christian can be, you know, the main man of the country. A church can't be the main runner of the country. So the the archbishop of the Catholic Church cannot be in control of the, the, the country with his Catho- Catholic views enforcing Catholicism on everybody in the that, country. And that, that's the key point. Yeah. That's, that's the so, key point. So the, the, I mean, I think Kuiper... Abraham Kuyper, I think mm-hmm. he was a pastor and the prime minister all at yeah. the same time. So I don't think it's so much to do with what they his role they is. They can't share the role. It's yeah. about it's about the function of that role. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, but it wouldn't it wouldn't mean that. Oh, so, wait, hold sorry. On, one, one, one question. One, one question. I might answer it. I might answer it. Just hold on. Well, that, he is a wealth of knowledge. Yeah, I am. <laughs> yes. Don't don't want to brag, guys. But <laughs> Book of George, <laughs> chapter three. So in chapter three. Uh, so, but what that doesn't mean is that his Catholic views, if he is a Catholic, doesn't have an effect on the way he runs the country. You're saying it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. That's correct. It does mean that it does have an effect. So, if a Christian, evangelical Christian, is the Prime Minister of Australia, pause, and um, <laughs> quote unquote, um, his, his Christian views should impact the way he governs or plays out that role. I would go further. I would say it's it's unavoidable. Yeah, yeah. Um, your religion is always something that impacts mm. how you live every area of your life, and so, um, if you were a Christian and the prime minister or in in or a politician, you can't you can't not operate based on your Christian understanding. Can I quickly go back to something Tom said? Oh, yeah, I just want to ask him. So you mentioned that, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's okay for a pastor to be a prime minister and a pastor. I don't see any wrong, anything wrong with it. Okay. No, that, that that's fine. Oh, that's what you want to ask. Yeah, 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 I just oh, wanted okay. to understand. I mean, I, do so you think I, I, I was just referencing Abraham Kuyper. I don't know yeah. if he was, I don't know if he was pastor and prime minister at of, the same of the time. Netherlands at the same time, but yeah. it, it's knowing him, it's entirely possible. Well. Yeah. <laughs> well, he definitely was a pastor. And he definitely was Prime Minister. Of the Netherlands. Whether they were at the same time, we don't know. But I don't see any theoretical issue with that. Yeah. Look, would you say it'd be more of an exception than a rule bar? Because well, I, I, don't, I don't mind looking at it as an exception. Oh, but, yeah. But sure. Well, most, you, people, you would just rather have, most people just have one job. That's well, yeah, <laughs> but and you you would rather your pastors, you know, be given to the word and to prayer. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I'm just saying, in terms of the theoretical construct we're setting up, yeah, yeah, of what we're talking about, yeah. it's not an issue. That's that, right. That's not yeah. the issue. Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's all. And so, obviously, we've we've talked about this a little bit as well. Is that uh, states and churches both have their own authority? Yep, given to them, um, and that authority is given to the one who has all authority. So Christ says in Matthew 28, "All authority is given to me under heaven and in earth." Um, therefore go uh, and he gives he delegates authority to the church he delegates authority to the state and they have their own separate authority yeah, yeah. and and just to be clear too that's always been the case even before christ ascended to the throne mm. um you know in in daniel you see nebuchadnezzar ruler of the biggest kingdom on earth work out that God who put him there, yeah. yeah. And just to engage with that that clip that you played at the beginning, um, to say that you know your, your bearings as a Christian and your worldview as a Christian and your biblical morals and values as a Christian have no part to play in politics is just nonsensical. And to believe that you know the early founders, even of our nation, um, even though not perfect in the Constitution. But even our founders hold held 
to Christian values that we see that are applied in our constitution and in our country right now, not because they thought it was a great idea, but because they got it from the scriptures. And I'm sure that they would have testified to the same thing. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's this weird. The, it seems like today we're able to do this weird double think thing, where like this this lady is saying, um, your religious morality has to be, has to not be imposed on your legislation, and yet that r- lady has religious morality that she's imposing on the legislation itself, and, and she's so she's using it. As she says it, and she doesn't even realize she's using her religious morality, her freedom of speech to say what she wants <laughs> as she rejects yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And her and her religious morality is is that only Christ, Christians aren't allowed to talk, basically. Yeah. And, you know, she actually goes on to say that she is a Christian. Well, there you go. But but that's my point. I mean, with that's, it's this double thing, right? So Christians seem to be able to sit there and defend something like abortion in law whilst saying they think it's wrong. And it's just, it's like, well, I, I just don't feel like I can impose my morality on on the law. Um, all, the, all the while, the atheists and the secularists are imposing their morality upon you. Oh, and I just took my finger out of this. <laughs> <laughs> Here <Look> it is. <laughs> <laughs> Listen now. Yeah, but well, you're exactly right. I mean, here's Schaefer. Um on how we got to where we are, he first points out that the humanists in their manifesto and in multiple court cases acknowledge that they are a religion um, and that and that they want to impose their truth on society. Mm. Um, yeah, and then maybe this is pushing us forward a bit, but then he says, most fundamentally our culture, society, government and law are in the condition they are in not because of a conspiracy, but because the church has forsaken its duty to yeah. be the salt of the culture. That's very good. Yeah. You nailed it on the head. Yeah. So, moving forward, if Christ is Lord and Lord over all things, uh, you know, how, how, does, how should, I guess maybe we should really think about Maybe answering another question, but how should the state look like if Christ is Lord? Is is it something that's just purely secular, or or should Christians, you know, obviously we said that Christians should be involved, but how Christian should the state be? How Christian should the state be? Yeah. So, <laughs> oh wait, okay, I get what you're saying now. <laughs> All right, how so? How Christ-like should the state be? Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that it really depends mm. because you you have different types of government all over the place, and you're different. You have different um, structures of of society. Um, so, in one sense, if you're using the word "should" as being what's the ideal, mm. well, the ideal is that you have a Christian nation, as in they're legislating. Mor- all law is mora- is morality. You know, yep. everything stems from your understanding of right and wrong. Yep. That's why we have laws against weaseling your way out of taxes, for example, because yep. it's, we believe it's wrong to rob the government of their due. Um, we have laws against speeding because we think it's wrong to put other people's lives at risk. Like it, all law is morality. Yep. And so the it, you, what's the ideal nation? The ideal nation is one where all those moralities line up with the Bible. Very good. But that's not like we we're not there yet. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> we'll get there one day, um, depending if you post mill or not. But <laughs> <laughs> but either, even if you're not, we'll get there one day when Christ returns. But um, but in the meantime, we live in different cultures. And so, you, for example, what if you have a king, like a monarchy situation, where you've got a king who you who do, you don't have any decision making power over this, um. This ruler. It's not a democracy. It's not a democracy. And he's and he's ungodly. Mm. Well in that what should it look like is is different to is what it, it does look like. Yep. You know? And even in democracy, a democracy just is ultimately um, a reflection of the people. Yeah. And so if right. you have if you have an ungodly nation, a whole bunch of 
people who are in general not godly mm. are going to have ungodly rulers. So I, I would also go back and say the the first point is whether it is a king, whether it is a democracy, whether it's a dictatorship, whoever is in charge needs to recognize Christ as Lord mm. over his position. Should recognize. Over, should. Should. So should yeah, that's the ideal that we're talking about. That's the ideal. That's, and, yeah. But the thing is the church and Christians have a role in telling him that that's the case. Uh, and and that's what I was getting at. So then you I was going to jump. Yeah, I was, I was going to jump back to what you said. But if it's an ungodly nation, then you're most likely going to have ungodly leaders. Well, like this woman that just confessed to be a Christian, most Christians have no idea about the Lordship of Christ. They have no idea about this this doctrine that we're talking about between separation of church and state. Um, and they believe that what they're doing and their views come from self and from self-compassion, um, humanism, things like that. So it's just, yeah, easy to say, but a total recognition of Lordship of Jesus Christ. I actually think you can get there from multiple angles. So you, you can come at it from the Lordship of Christ. So, you, you know, the church and Christians have a responsibility to tell their leaders Jesus is king and he will judge you for the decisions you make. Just like they have that the same responsibility to tell their neighbors yep. that, you know, Jesus is king and he'll judge you for the decisions you make. Um, but you can also come at it from, uh, say, a biblical example. So you go and look at. Uh, John the Baptist, he gets beheaded for what? For telling a Roman ruler that he shouldn't have married his brother's wife. Like I thought you couldn't tell people your Christian beliefs and impose it on other people. Yeah, well, that's apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's interesting because he, cause he's not in a Christian context, he's not in a democracy, and yet he feels as a... A Christian, as a, a man of God, he has this duty to go and tell the king, no, you've done the wrong th- I think it might be the governor, but you've done the wrong thing here. Um, so you can get it that way. And even if you look back into the Old Testament, when God provided a human king to Israel, he still said, my prophets will still be here. But yeah, yep. And the role of the prophet was to keep the king in check. Um According to scripture and the, and the law of God, and we see Nathan do that to David. Yeah. Um, when Saul Elijah does it in. to Ahab. Yep. Yep. Um, Even Paul does it to Agrippa. He preaches the yep. gospel to him. To Felix as well. Yep. To Felix, yep. yep. Samuel does it. So throughout so. the whole Bible, God has been prophetic towards kings, rulers, governors, and calling them to obey his word. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, the, it was the priest's job as well. You know, the priests were to, to make sure that the the word of God was available for the kings mm-hmm. and to, they, the, I imagine the kings would be participating in the, the services um, when in the theocracy that was Israel. Mm. Um, so there was always this teaching of the kings going on. Mm. So, so backing up to George's question, right? In, in plain sense, what does a, a government or a parliament um, that is Christianized, what does that, look like and in in our let, let's deal with australia so right now we have parliaments where we have the upper house and the lower house and bills have to get passed through the upper house uh, through the lower house and the upper house to get passed and put into our nation so i would simply say our parliament our government should be putting bills forward that align with scripture and they should just be getting passed by lower and upper house. And they should be rejecting bills like the one that got passed today. Yeah, so upper and lower house should be rejecting bills from parliament that go against scripture, Mm. the word of God. Like, yeah, the euthanasia bill that got passed today. Mm. Very sad. So another question, if the church and state are separate, um, is there any way that you guys think that uh, the church state is imposing their influence upon the church where they shouldn't be oh definitely i i think you know it's all good to say in a, from the secular point of view they love to jump up and down and say you know church and state need to be separate when we vote on these matters but the imposing of the state on the church is happening constantly 
and no one bats an eye, not mm. even the church. Yeah. Which is sad. So we saw that through the pandemic when we were forced to, to close up churches. We weren't allowed to partake in the preaching of the word, in fellowship with one another, in singing of psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Mm. Um, I think it Tom being an elder, I'll let him <laughs> I've said quite a bit. Good. I don't know if you want to. <laughs> Oh, no, you go, you go. I think more, and it's not really the state. I think it's the idea that it's played off the whole separation of church and state. You could almost put state and replace it with um, culture or society or the public sphere Yeah, where people say, you can have your Christianity, that's fine, have it at home. You can have your Christianity, that's fine, keep it in the church building. Sounds like Russia, sounds like China, Korea. Sounds like Australia. Yep. Sounds like Australia. So a lot of the times people um, and Christians think this way. We think, yeah, we can have our Christianity. I, I'm free to be a Christian. I'm a Christian. But I'm a Christian in church or I'm a Christian sometimes at home. You know, we don't allow Christianity to express itself fully out in the world, out in the culture. Um, and so I think... So yeah, and yeah. Well, and I think fully, I think fully is a good, good qualifier there as well. I mean, we were talking before the the um, the show about Kevin Rudd, and yep. and some comments he made early on in Scomo's um, mm. prime ministership, and an essay that he wrote in like two thousand and six um, about how Kevin Rudd thinks that Christianity should impact his politics. So he do, he doesn't think that Christianity shouldn't impact his politics mm. at all. He just thinks that it should be limited mm. to social justice and environmentalism, which I think is really interesting because you can, like there are elements of those two things if you come at them from the right perspective in the Bible. Yep. Um, maybe not in the way the words are used today, but um, but you can see parts of them there. And they're probably two of the things that would would most readily be accepted by yeah, society. Yeah, I was, I was, I was like, <laughs> it's like, I know where you're come going on, mate. with this. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's an easy one, you know? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, you don't, you don't want to say, well, am I, you know, my understanding of murder, you know, that's something I think should apply from the scriptures. Yeah. It's uh, only environmentalism. It's like, it's almost like saying as a Christian today, uh, oh, it's, it's, it was so wicked. Uh, slavery was one of the most yeah, wicked, yeah. abhorrent things. But they'll never say anything about abortion, yeah. or they'll never speak about euthanasia. It's easy to talk about abortion. That's something that was you know that was dealt slavery, with. It's easily to talk about slavery. Yeah, because it was dealt with two, three hundred years. Oh, oh, don't quote me now. Hundred, hundred fifty years ago, whatever it might be. Sorry, uh, but it was something that was dealt with. Something that's in the past, and we don't have to deal with it today. Yeah. yeah. But to deal with something that's difficult, many Christians just don't want to talk about it. We're just happy to just sit by and just let it and let. And let, let it go on, you know what I mean? And and it's interesting that Kevin Rudd picked on those two things, which are also socially acceptable, and he used Bonhoeffer to do it. How dare he? <laughs> How dare he? <laughs> Bonhoeffer, who's who stood up for <laughs> the you know the murder of Jews, yeah. when when <laughs> even the church wasn't, yeah, you know, uh, it and and hey, he was a German. What do you mean? <laughs> no. I don't get it. <laughs> That went over both our after, heads. After Luther, <laughs> only oh, yeah, wacky okay. views come out of Germany. No, no, bon, bon had very good views. He had very good views. So where were we? <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, Kevin Rudd. Kevin Rudd. So yeah, we're the, talking about Kevin Rudd and how he he finds that it's so, um, you know, so mighty of him to to have these two views that his Christianity stands up for. But ask him, you know, should should you? Christian views impact the way you view abortion. Oh, no. He'd probably say no. Yeah. It wouldn't affect his politics. It wouldn't affect the way he made policies back in 2006. Well, so aside from social justice and environmental policies. Yeah, well, policies. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The easy ones he'll do, that's for it. sure. That's yeah. it. Yeah. 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 And I guess I want to sort of swim back. Around. We've spoken a, bit, a lot about how the church, you know, how in throughout the Bible that uh, the church and the prophets and the priests were prophetic towards the state. Uh, but bringing it down to where we are today as Christians, what are some things practically that we can do as Christians that we ought to, I guess, have an influence on uh, the culture around us, the politics in particular, because um, we're talking about church and state here. What are some practical steps that we can take as Christians um, 
to have an impact on that? Yeah, yeah, good, good question. Um, I mean, I think in because of the situation we're in, we're in a democracy in Australia, so which means ultimately that y- um, you all, everyone, is the foundation of government. Um, we we appoint our own governors, and they're resp- they're actually answerable to us even while they're serving. Mm. Uh, their job is to represent their the people in their electorate. Um, which means that your local MP, both uh, local government, state government and federal government in all houses thereof, so you probably have five or six local MPs that, that, are, that are responsible for answering for you mm-hmm. and your community. Fellow, fellow community's yep. views on things. What that means is that you should have dialogue with them. Mm. You know, you should be doing the, the John the Baptist thing and... Um, putting it putting it in front of them. Hey, you're you've got a vote coming up on euthanasia. Well, you can't do this now because it's too late in New mm-hmm. South Wales. But um, you know you've you've got an opportunity here coming up. This is what I believe. Mm. And this is what the Bible says. And you can you can even be fairly firm in your language. Yeah. Um, Thus saith the Lord. Quote yep. some scripture. You know. Um, I would I would I wouldn't even say it's too late to go back in the euthanasia thing. Oh, not at all. I actually I actually think. We've been on the back foot for way too long, and we we think that the Christian's job is to stop bad. No, nah. well, actually, the Christian's job is to promote good, mm-hmm. um, and to stop bad certainly. But when was the last time we we had a bill introduced to roll back yeah. some evil? There you, you go. Know? And yeah. I, I think they have been introduced. I think there was one um, seeking to defund abortion at the federal level. Mm. A few years ago, um, and it actually it wasn't like a total write off. Um, there was there were people who voted for it, so got some good ground in it. I, th- I think so. Don't quote me on that, but yeah. Um, so I think I think we should be doing more of that. We should be saying, "Hey, we want you to be introducing bills that do this sort of thing," and then even finding friendly politicians who who agree, who you know, Christian politicians, and seeking to back them and. And encourage them on in in putting up these bills because it it wouldn't be an easy thing, right? If your job, imagine your job at work, and your job's to come up with ideas, and every idea you come up with that's Christian gets shot down in flames. You know, gets taken to a vote with all the with all your fellow workers and just gets destroyed. Mm. That's pretty demoralizing. Yeah. You know? So yeah. if you're if there's Christians in Parliament, we should be. Encouraging, encouraging them, encouraging them, you know, emailing them, yeah. calling their office or whatever. I think that's one thing that Christians have really lacked in is engaging with their politicians. Just you know, if they're good politicians, let them know, hey, we're, we're praying for you. Um, we, you know, we care about our society, we care about our culture, we care about, um, you know, the political sphere, and we're backing you. Um, and you know, we're here to support you. If there's anything we can do, let us know. Um, I think Christians need to step up in this. And another way that we can do this as well is by actually voting correctly. I know we spoke about this last week, but I'm just going to say it again. Like, go out there um, and vote uh, candidates that will, I guess, uphold strong Christian values, strong moral, um, biblical laws. Anything else you want to say? You look like you. No, I, um, I guess I, I'd also encourage, encourage actually getting involved in mm. politics, joining a party, and even trying to become a politician. Um, I I remember when I was younger, I thought, man, it must be really hard to get into politics. But to be honest with you, I don't think it's as hard as what a lot of people think it is. It's actually very easy. I Yeah, I know a lot of people in the past year or so that have put their names in um, with with minority parties to be candidates for their local areas. And I, I remember when I was younger, it was a pipe dream. Like, this must be the hardest thing to get involved in politics, but it's really not. And not only should we be encouraging, you know, Christians our age to be getting involved in politics, but we should be raising up our children to get involved in politics. Mm. Um, we should be strengthened because politics is not an easy place to be, especially today. Let's be honest; it's really not easy, and there's a lot of games that sadly get played amongst politicians. 
But if we raise our kids in the right way with the right values and strong-minded children, not, you know, sadly this soft world, but with strong-minded children and get them involved in politics, mm. it, it's very, you know, advantageous. Yeah. Like, ultimately, it's not the end game. You know, Christ is Lord. And mm. I, know when, I know when you're saying raise our children... You mean raising our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord um, to raise them um, the, way Christ, the, way, the way Christ has called us to raise our kids. So I know you fully mean that. Um, and yeah. But, but politics is a lawful profession. That's, yeah, that's, that's the what point, he's getting right? at. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's not like I haven't met many Christians who go, oh, yeah, I want to be a politician when I grow up. Mm. Yeah. So I get your point there. Yeah. It could be something that we, that we should think about more. Mm. Um, and it comes down to not mixing religion and politics. What is that? What do you mean? <laughs> well, no, no, like we have a view that we shouldn't really ah, r- mix well those I, two. But I think that's part of it. I think the other part of it might be that um, that it's just it is a hard place to be. Like yeah, for a Christian, they, like I said, yeah. they play they play games and yeah, they're games that Christians right. don't really want to play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you if that's something that's on on your heart that you think you hear the sound of Christian politician, you go, Oh, that's, that sounds interesting. Then, um, you know, there's guys like Wilberforce who you could read, read biographies of, see how they did it. Mm. Uh, Cause these guys were, he, well, he was Abraham Kuyper. You just Abraham mentioned Kuyper, before. Another great one. Yeah. 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 So there's, there's, there's Christians who've done it in the past and, and done wonderful things. Mm. So it's, it's quite doable. Very good. Very good. Any final comments, protests, thoughts, um, I oh know. I'll just encourage. Just on top of what Tom just said, it, it it is hard for Christians to be involved in politics because the way they play the political game. Um, but we also understand that God ordains our governments, and if He sees fit to to place a Christian politician in there, um, in His timing, there there will be. I think we just need to submit to that and mm. and raise our children, um, in a way where that's a potential. Mm. Well, uh, the last thing I'd say, sorry, yeah. is yeah. um, is that we've talked about how we think Christians should um, raise their raise Christian morality to politicians and to their governments. Um, the reality is that if we don't do it, we know that the that the the other side will, and they mm. have been, and they are, and they will continue to, and they will shout really loud. Um, about their morality, yeah. Um, and so we've we've got we've got the King of all, who's who will reign yep. forever and ever. Um, we know the truth. Mm. We know the consequences of not following the truth. Um, and so it's really a kindness and, yep. and a necessity to yeah. to bring these things before our our government There's and say you, this is this is what God requires of you yeah that's very good very good there's a saying that goes uh you may not be post mill but they are <laughs> <laughs> well on on that note um a better time than ever to to wrap up so the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face run upon you and be gracious to you the lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace god bless you.